Love. This is the World According to Zig podcast for April 27th, 2019. My name is John Ziegler. I'm the host of this show where you can still get the truth about the news of the day from a conservative perspective in this world turned upside down. Our website is freespeechbroadcasting.com. And I remind you once again that if you're interested in content that is directly related to President Donald Trump, I have a new podcast, although it's not quite as new as it used to be. We're now into episode number 25 that I urge you to check out because that's where you'll find all your Trump-related news. It's called Individual One. You can find it on iTunes or Wooska or the best place to go for a direct link is freespeechbroadcasting.com where you'll be able to directly access the Individual One podcast. The World According to Zig podcast For about the last uh, almost two months, we've been not exclusively, but at least in part, focused on trying to tell the truth about an HBO documentary that they call a documentary. It's really just a fictional movie called Leaving Neverland, which is supposedly the case against Michael Jackson made by two accusers by the name of James Safechuck and Wade Robson, that they were sexually abused by Michael Jackson many, many years ago. And only now, as they're suing the Jackson estate, coming forward with these horrific stories of sexual abuse as children. And we have probably done more than any other outlet in America, which is not saying much, since the American media has been completely pathetic in so many different ways, especially on this a particular issue, we've done more in getting out the truth about what this movie really was and was not, doing interviews that a few other people are willing and able to do, including with members of the Jackson family and with a British journalist by the name of Charles Thompson. And last week, I promised that we would do the first interview post leaving Neverland with Michael Jackson's criminal defense attorney, Tom Mesero. And as a man who keeps my promises, uh, I did do that interview this week. Uh, Just to give you a sense, by the way, of how I roll, um, because I think it provides some interesting context for the interview as well as, uh, you know, what makes me tick and, and how strange my life is. You know, this podcast is done for free. We have essentially no resources. We pay only for the bare bones minimum production costs. And essentially, this costs me money to do, uh, especially when I do things like I did this week. Because here's what happened. Tom Mesro, who I've gotten to know over the last several years, I'll get to that momentarily, had agreed to do his first extensive interview since leaving Neverland. And the reason why he hadn't done one is because he had been working on a trial in Texas until very recently. And so I said, Tom, when are you available? And we tried to schedule him for last week's uh, podcast on a weekend, but he was out of town. He's a very busy guy. And so I said, okay, uh, when can I meet with you? Because I want to make sure this is done right. And I'd like to do this by video if possible, because video is always better than audio in this day and age. And I live just outside of Los Angeles. So he says, well, I'm free Monday morning. So I'm okay, fine. So I Uh, drive myself down to his office in Los Angeles, which is depending on traffic. You never know in Los Angeles. Is that an hour? Is that an hour and a half? Is that two hours? It's two and a half hours. You never know. Uh, So I drive myself down there, you know, paying for my own gas, paying for my own parking. He he was nice enough to validate, but they didn't give me enough validation stickers, which always seems to be the case. So I had to pay $12 for parking, and I spent about an hour with Tom Mesero uh, doing this really good interview. I then put it on the first part of it. It's about 46, 47 minutes long. I put the first 30 minutes of it on YouTube so that I could write an article about it for Dan Abrams' website, Dan Abrams of ABC News, who I work for for media. He also owns a website called Law and Crime, which I thought was the more appropriate place for this particular story. So I did a column about the interview, and we posted the video within that column. And these things are always way more difficult than they should be, especially on this kind of topic 
topic because everyone who's editing doesn't know anything about the story and they're always so damn afraid of offending anybody and of course sex abuse accusers get all benefit of the doubt and it's just it's just it's a pain in the ass and frankly i didn't even get paid to do that column because that was outside my normal contract as a columnist for mediate so i did that for free too so the amount of Man hours I put into this, uh, frankly, I mean, for, for getting paid no money. It was it's just flat out ridiculous. Uh, but I, I wanted to do this right. I wanted to get the story out there. Thankfully, and the only, reason, the only reason I do this is because there are people who desperately want this content. And most of them, not all, but most of them are Michael Jackson fans who have been incredibly loyal and interested and substantive uh, during this entire process, they they they've gotten an enormously bad rap from people who call them truthers and cult members and fanatics. Yeah, they love Michael Jackson, but by and large, they have been very focused on the facts and in a very credible way, far more so than the moronic news media has been. And so I posted this on YouTube and did the long crime article, which you can find at freespeechbroadcasting.com, and I urge you to do so. And the first 30 minutes of this thing on YouTube, but my, my last check had like 65,000 views. It's probably more than that now because it's been a while since I checked. So clearly people love this interview. Well, I've decided that I would put the entire interview out on this edition of the podcast so it, the YouTube version is about 29 minutes long. This is about 46, 47 minutes long. Uh, you, you, so if you've already seen the YouTube version, some of this is going to be a repeat. But it's worth listening to again. And when you listen to this, I urge you to listen carefully to what Tom Mesero does say and what he doesn't say. Because this goes to someone's credibility. I'm a big, big believer that sometimes what a person doesn't say to you when they could easily do so, goes more to their credibility than anything. Let me, what I mean by that is this. When we interviewed Brandy Jackson, Michael Jackson's niece, who dated Wade Robson for seven or eight years, including uh, during the time period where Robson claims now he was sexually abused by Jackson, there were several things that she said during that interview, and there are several things that she has said to me after that interview where she easily could have embellished. She easily could have gone further than her knowledge allowed her to do. She clearly knows Robson is lying, so she could have made stuff up. She could have claimed that Robson told her that, that he was never abused by Michael Jackson and he was going to make up a story one day or something like that. She doesn't do anything like that. In fact, after the interview, and uh, there was a, a story that came up about whether or not Wade Robson had really gone with his family to the Grand Canyon when he was a child, when he now claims that he stayed back and was abused by Michael Jackson. Well, that's something that in theory, since she knew him back in this era and had dated him for a long period of time, she could have made up a story about how he talked about having visited the Grand Canyon, right? She didn't do that. In fact, when I went to her, she says, I wish I could remember something about that. I have no knowledge of this at all. That, to me, goes to someone's credibility. Well, similarly with Tom Mesereau, there are several moments in this interview where Mesereau stopped short of where he easily could go, where a Johnny Cochran clearly would have gone, uh, which is interesting because Cochran also at one point represented Michael Jackson. But Mesereau is, is a fact guy, and I've gotten to know him over the last several years in a very strange way typical of john Ziegler's bizarre life this will also give you some insight as to what makes me tick and why my life is so weird so tom Ezra doesn't know me from adam right i'm a, i was a long time los angeles talk show host but tom Ezra doesn't listen to talk radio he's a liberal he's a busy guy i had actually covered the jackson trial uh, as a talk show host at KFI in Los Angeles. But, you know, Mesereau was incredibly busy at that point. He's not focused on what's happening in talk radio in Los Angeles. And I and so I guarantee you he had no idea who I was. When I contacted him via email, I guess this would have been in 2014. And the reason why I contacted him via email was I had been researching the so-called Penn State Joe Paterno Jerry Sandusky scandal. And I had become convinced after a couple of years of investigation that the whole thing was a fraud, that against everything you've been told, Jerry Sandusky was actually innocent. 
And I had interviewed Sandusky for several hours in prison on the phone. I didn't even like the guy, but he was, and he's weird, and he's got weird boundary issues, but he's not a child molester, and the accusers are as lacking in credibility, if not more so, than Wade Robson and James Safechuck are in Leaving Neverland. And so I emailed Tom Mazzaro and I said, look, Tom, I know that you've defended Joe Paterno. I know you were a fan of Joe Paterno. Uh, you've not really chimed in on Sandusky. I'd like to meet with you to tell you about the Sandusky story. Now, 99% of people in Tom Mazzaro's position, you know, his time is literally worth thousands and thousands of dollars. He's going to go, you know, pound, tell me to go pound sand. Thanks for getting in touch with me. But, you know, I'm a busy guy. Go screw yourself. Uh, Tom Mesro did not do that. Tom Mesro, somewhat to my surprise, said, sure, come on in. Love to meet with you. So I come in. I give him my presentation. I show him some documents. And Tom Mesro immediately got where I was coming from and did so on a factual basis. And I was telling him a story that made a hell of a lot more sense than the bullcrap narrative that the media was selling. And Mesro didn't just stop there. He wasn't just like, oh, that's really nice. Good job. You know, take care. I convinced Mesro to write a column for a local state college newspaper, which they picked up exactly as I predicted they would, where he makes the argument that the Sandusky case should be <clears throat> reexamined. Now, to be fair, Mesro had a lot of help in writing that column. <laughs> But but Tom was really accommodating with the whole thing, and uh, I was very impressed that he was willing to do that, to put his name on it, and he was helpful to that cause. And I've interviewed Tom since then a couple of times. I've actually met with him. He invited me to go to a, a, a movie screening that he was involved with, which I did. Uh, here at, it was actually at USC, and we met afterwards then. So we've had some sort of a friendly relationship, and I always enjoy my time with Tom. Tom, like me, is an odd bird. I mean, he's an odd guy. He's a far more successful odd guy than I am. Uh, but I really respect his intellect and his reverence for facts, logic, and the law. So keep that in mind as you listen to this. Now, the full interview, the first extensive one, that Michael Jackson's criminal defense attorney who got that acquittal in 2005 in Santa Barbara against charges of uh, child molestation against Michael Jackson, his first interview since the bogus so-called HBO documentary, Leaving Neverland. I'm here with uh, Tom Mesro, the famed defense attorney for Michael Jackson from his 2005 criminal trial to talk about the Leaving Neverland movie on HBO. Tom, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for inviting me. Always a pleasure. It's always great to talk to you. And uh, one of the things I want to talk about first is there's this notion that Dan Reed, the director of Leaving Neverland, has put out there. That there's this Jackson machine ready to destroy uh, anyone who dares to question the narrative of this film. And I laugh at that because you, you and I have been in touch for quite a while. And I know that if there was a Jackson machine, you, you would have been paid to be on every television show possible as soon as this movie came out, but you were actually on trial yourself and unable to immediately respond. Is that a fair, is that an accurate? Well, I wasn't on trial. I was in a trial. <laughs> You're in a trial. <laughs> good, good, good clarification. I was, I was defending someone, <laughs> right? Uh, which is my profession. That's what I do. Look, uh, Michael Jackson was at one point the most famous person on the planet. He, uh, he was incomparable in terms of his talent, his influence on music, on dance, on choreography. He has millions of fans all over the world. He has a very lucrative estate uh, that the lawyers for the estate have built up. And he has many supporters. But, you know, we live in the era of Me Too. We live in the era of media doing what media wants. And the idea that somebody is controlling the media about Michael Jackson is utterly ridiculous. I mean, when I walked into his defense in 2004, uh, what I saw was so disturbing to me and that was that the worldwide media had condemned him, they were attacking him, they had already convicted him, they tried to convict him during the trial with their coverage, they tried to convict him during jury deliberations when major networks had were showing the jail cells they thought he was going to go to and that kind of thing. So anyone who tells me that the pro-Jackson forces control the world media when it comes to Michael Jackson is la it's laughable it's ridiculous and it is and part of that narrative though of course when I'm when I'm trying mm -hmm. to set straight is 
you're not being paid to do interviews on behalf of the Jackson estate. You're not held on retainer by them. You're doing this because you believe in the truth. Yes, and I, I believe in the experience that I had with one of the accusers. Uh, I interviewed Wade Robson uh, for hours before he testified. I interviewed his mother and daughter before they testified. I called all three as witnesses. They were among the most powerful witnesses in support of Michael Jackson. Mr. Robson was a very articulate, likable, intelligent, seemed like a nice person. He was adamant that Michael Jackson had never done anything improper towards him at any time. The mother and sister backed him up. They had traveled with Wade and Michael Jackson. They had slept in Michael Jackson's bed. They said nothing improper ever happened. And they were so strongly in favor of Michael Jackson, so strongly against the prosecution of Michael Jackson, that I made them all star witnesses for the defense. So I interviewed them. I chatted with them at length. Then I called them as witnesses. They testified under oath. I only know my portion of this, and that is that these people were adamant that nothing improper had ever happened. Well, let's talk, take a look, closer look at that, because to believe the narrative in Leaving Neverland, especially with regard to Wade Robson, you have to believe that you, Tom Mesero, are a moron, essentially, because you took a guy who had been abused for seven years by your client and made him and his family the centerpiece of your defense. Are you not personally offended by that? Well, it was more than that. You know, I had to think long and hard about whether we needed to put on a defense case at all. You know, in American criminal courtrooms, the prosecution must prove their case beyond any reasonable doubt. And that means they must prove every element, element of a charged offense beyond any reasonable doubt. I had so many effective cross-examinations during the prosecution's case that I had to think long and hard about whether we needed to put on a defense. We could have rested right there and not called a single witness. But I concluded that we would probably have gotten a hung jury at that point, that we had to tell our own story. And we needed our own witnesses in support of Michael, and we had a lot of them that were very powerful witnesses. So I elected to put on a defense. When a defense lawyer in a criminal case elects to put on a defense, you typically want to start strong and end strong. And I started with a very strong witness, Wade Robson, I ended with a, also a very strong witness, uh, Chris Tucker, and I wouldn't have called this person as my first witness if I hadn't felt he was really strong and would start off the defense case in a very compelling manner, and he did. He, he testified emphatically that he had not been abused and properly touched in any way. He, he was subjected to a very strong, powerful cross-examination by Ron Zonin, an excellent prosecutor for the Santa Barbara County District Attorney's Office. He withstood that cross-examination. His mother and sister were in the similar position. I call them early in the defense case. They were powerful witnesses for Michael Jackson, powerful in their statements that nothing improper had happened as far as they knew, and they all were subjected to cross-examination. So. I started our defense case very strong with one of the most powerful witnesses I had seen in favor of Michael Jackson, and that was Mr. Wade Robson. And what you just said there is really important because the whole essence of Wade Robson's current story in Leaving Neverland is that he's not claiming repressed memories suddenly hit him in his 30s that he was abused by Michael Jackson. He's claiming that he didn't understand what had happened was quote unquote sexual abuse. But that's not what he was asked at trial. He wasn't asked just, hey, did anything bad ever happen with you and Michael? He was asked very specific questions about physical acts, which he very strongly declared did not happen, correct? Absolutely. He was very, very powerful in his testimony that nothing, directly or indirectly, that's improper, had ever happened to him. He wasn't improperly touched, he wasn't in improperly fondled, he wasn't improperly molested. We went through all of this in direct examination and he was subjected to a powerful cross-examination. And he was a stalwart witness in support of Michael Jackson's innocence. He was one of the strongest I heard, that's why I called him first. And in making that decision, I'm, I'm assuming something here and I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming you would consult your client, Michael Jackson, 
about his experiences with Wade and whether or not he thought it was a good idea to put Wade on the stand. Did that happen? Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, I, I don't want to go into privileged right. inf information, but obviously Michael Jackson knew Wade was going to be my first witness. I, I obviously told him about that, and he had no problem with that at all. I mean, Wade was a strong, powerful supporter of Michael Jackson and maintain that he had been to Neverland, he had associated with Michael, he had traveled with Michael, and nothing improper had ever happened at any time. He was so strong, I mean, I made him our first witness for a reason. But just to, to further clarify that, the, the narrative in Leaving Neverland is Michael Jackson is a criminal mastermind. And I, I look at that and wait, well, hold on a second. If a criminal, ma you can't have him be a criminal mastermind and also have him allow you to put a guy he abused for seven years on the stand first, right? I mean, those are contradictory narratives, are that they That would not? be a version of insanity, and that's not what I did. Right. I was there to win. I was there to win for an innocent person, and the jury saw it our way for, for many, many reasons. Now, mm. continuing with Wade's claim that uh, what, what his testimony was about, I don't even know if you're aware, but in both of his lawsuit and in Leaving Neverland, Wade specifically claims he received a subpoena to testify in the 2005 trial as if he did so against his own wishes, like he was forced to testify. Does that shock you to hear that allegation by Wade Robson? It does shock me. Now, typically in a criminal case, if we need a witness, we will typically ask the witness, do you want a subpoena or not? Some people do because they have employment responsibilities. They want to be able to tell their employer, I have a subpoena, I have to testify. And very often they don't need a subpoena. And my understanding of Wade Robson was he didn't need a subpoena at all. He and his mother and sister all came to Neverland ready to voluntarily support Michael Jackson in and outside the courtroom. And that's what they did. So the best of your knowledge, then, Wade is not telling the truth when he claims to have gotten a subpoena to testify. I don't recall whether anyone handed him a subpoena or not. What I do know is he didn't require one because he was willing to help Michael Jackson at all times. He was willing to be there when needed. That was always my understanding. Whether anyone actually filled out a subpoena and gave him one or whether he even requested one, I really don't know. Okay. And let's talk about the rest of his family, too, because his mother is a key figure in this story. She's the one that effectively facilitated the relationship between Wade and Michael Jackson. It is my belief that we have found some information about her on Facebook that discredits her current story that she was still a fan of Michael Jackson well after Wade comes forward on the Today Show in 2013. What do you recall about her testimony and the testimony of her daughter as well, who you called in the 2000s? Well, I just recall that the mother and sister were very supportive of Wade and his testimony in favor of Michael Jackson. Uh, as I recall, and I haven't been through their testimony in years, but mm. as I recall, they traveled with Michael and Wade. They were in the bed with Michael and Wade, sometimes sleeping in Michael's huge bed. This notion that, uh, that he had a normal-sized bed is absurd. We proved that parents, siblings, all would sack out on Michael's bed. It was almost like a communal thing. But my understanding was that they were very supportive of him. They never detected anything improper, never suspected anything improper. That has always been my understanding of what they brought to the table in that trial. Now, in the bigger picture, what I find really disturbing, and I'm fascinated to hear your view, is that HBO and Dan Reed have taken Wade Robson's story as if it's gospel and just effectively determined that his testimony in 2005, as strong and as specific as it was, is, is irrelevant. As a, as a lawyer, not just a, you know, the lawyer of this case, but a lawyer in general who, who reveres the law and the standards of, uh, of testimony and under oath and perjury, I, I find that incredibly insulting and dangerous to the entire system. That once you make your declaration in the public under oath in a criminal trial of that magnitude, you can't go back and change your story. Well, remember... It, one of the top sex crimes prosecutors in America, Ron Zonin, and I've never been, I've never faced a better prosecutor than him. He was really just a passionate, skilled, experienced, determined prosecutor. He subjected Wade Robson to withering cross-examination. And this man knew how to question a sex crimes witness. 
and he could not shake Wade Robson. Wade Robson stood his ground, maintained his story under, under all sorts of pressure, and was also adamant, always adamant, that Michael Jackson never improperly touched him. But isn't it, Tom, dangerous that the media and a major media outlet like HBO and this film, which is being seen worldwide, is just pretending as if adult testimony under oath doesn't matter. Like, 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 like you can go back on that. That, to me, at, at what point do we reach chaos if that's, if that's going to be accepted? Well, uh, all I know is my slice of life. Right. All I know is the person that I spoke to, the person who I call as a witness, and there's no doubt in my mind he was telling the truth. It just seems to me, though, that if we if we accept the notion that your for, your past testimonies, I mean, in, as a defense lawyer, you know, if someone in, in, a, in before the current era we're living in, if you had someone who testified to something directly contradictory to what they're currently saying, that's game, set, match. That's the ball game, right? Well, I mean, uh, again, people will change their stories for various reasons, or they will come up with reasons to justify it. I mean, human beings have a great ability to justify to themselves whatever kind of behavior they want. But all I know is I spoke right. to him for hours. He testified on the stand. It was a the most watched trial of my lifetime. You had more accredited media from around the world than O.J. Simpson and Scott Peterson combined. And he was in the spotlight in that courtroom and subjected to withering, persistent, skilled, professional, experienced cross-examination. And he was adamant that Michael Jackson had not improperly treated him. And he was an adult who was <clears throat> very well versed in what sex was, uh, had been in numerous high-profile romantic relationships. This was not a naive guy. No, this was someone, in my opinion, very intelligent, very articulate, very perceptive, seemed very likable, and didn't look to me like he was making anything up. Now let's turn to uh, James Safechuck. Uh, I know you didn't uh, uh, interview a James Safechuck because James Safechuck had been determined by the judge to not be eligible to testify at the 2005 trial. Yet in Leaving Neverland, he tells a very detailed story that is critical to the narrative that both Michael Jackson and Michael Jackson's attorneys were contacting him into the late stages of the trial effectively begging him to testify, which he refused to do. Uh, that, to me, sounds completely contradictory to what we know as the factual record. How does that sound in comparison to your recollection of, those, of the events of 2005? It makes no sense, because the prosecution wanted to bring in witnesses to suggest that Mr. Safechuck was molested. The judge would not let them do that. At that point, the defense had no, no necessity to bring in Mr. Safechuck. In fact, it would have been insane. If we had called Mr. Safechuck, that would have opened the door for the prosecution to call witnesses they claimed would have testified that he had been molested. So this story doesn't make any sense to me. Now, I know I didn't contact him. Did someone behind my back contact him uh, in a way that was made no sense? I can't sp speak for that. But I know it makes no sense to think the defense was planning to call Mr. Safechuck. It would have been insane. And it is a fact that Mr. Safechuck had been declared by the judge well before the trial began as off-limits, correct? Well, off-limits for the prosecution. Right. Now, if the defense had brought him in as a witness, that would have opened the door for the prosecution in a rebuttal case to call right. in their witnesses about whether or not Mr. Safechuck had been molested. But it makes no sense for the defense right. to keep Mr. Safechuck available to call as a witness at that point. And what about the story of Michael Jackson calling James Safechuck in the middle of the trial intimidating him and desperately asking, demanding that he testify. Does that sound like the client that you knew? No, the Michael Jackson I know doesn't intimidate anybody and would not have contacted him and tried to scare him or threaten him. That doesn't make any sense to me. So you believe that's untrue based upon your knowledge? I don't believe Mr. Safechuck was contacted by the defense throughout the trial. I don't believe that because it was very clear before the trial started that any allegations about Mr. Safechuck were off limits. Now, one of the things that has actually gotten some fair media coverage and has contradicted the, the narrative of Leaving Neverland is that over the last several weeks, it has been revealed that a prime location 
where James Safechuck now claims, many, many years mm. later, that he was molested by Michael Jackson was the, the famous Neverland train station, uh, uh, the second floor of the train station. And, it is, and he claims that his, in the movie that his, and in his lawsuit that his abuse ended in 1992. And we now know that the construction of the train house didn't even begin until late 1993 and didn't finish until somewhere in the middle of 1994. Uh, the director, Dan Reed, <laughs> has claimed that, that that doesn't mean anything because he's just going to extend the date beyond which James Safechuck was actually abused, which then would make him 16 or 17 years old. I, I have a couple questions about this, but what's your, your first gut-level reaction to that shift in story as a defense attorney? Well, I don't believe these accusers. I just don't. I got to know Michael Jackson very closely during that terrible ordeal that he went through in, in Santa Maria in that courthouse. I got to know him. I sat with him through a five-month trial. I saw him reacting to some of the most horrific allegations you could have. I mean, people forget just how awful these allegations were. He was being accused of masterminding a criminal conspiracy to commit extortion, to abduct children, to falsely imprison a family. He was being accused of giving a cancer-stricken child alcohol to prepare the child to be molested. I mean, these were horrible allegations. I sat with him throughout that trial. I worked with him before the trial. I saw him after it. There is no doubt in my mind he was not a child molester, he was not a child abuser, and would never hurt a child, period. So when I hear these allegations suddenly popping up years after his death, they make no sense to me. I don't believe them. And my experiences with particularly Mr. Robson suggest to me there's something radically wrong with these accusations. But, all right, so let's take the train station thing a little bit more specifically. As a, if this were to go to a, a, a traditional trial, what would you, Tom Mesro, as a, as, a, as a very experienced and esteemed defense attorney, what would you do with that kind of a shift in story that doesn't just change uh, something that's minor? You know, it's in, Oprah Winfrey tried to pretend that this was a, a minor mismemory. This totally changes the timeline. It changes when he was abused, how old he was. Supposedly, Michael Jackson stopped being interested in these boys when they hit puberty, but now James Safechuck is a very old, mature, and tall 16, 17-year-old. What would you do if you were cross-examining James Safechuck well, in a situation like Well, it would like be a defense lawyer's dream. I don't know if you remember during the Michael Jackson criminal trial, one of uh, the accusers said that he had been shown a particular magazine um, as a, a, a grooming process. And we proved that the magazine had been published long after this person left Neverland. Evidence like that can be devastating. If Mr. Safechuck said he was molested in that train station and the station hadn't even been built, that could be devastating evidence for a jury in judging credibility. Now, I, I know this is, you're not involved in any of these cases directly, uh, but what do you make of what the estate is doing in trying to come to a, a way to adjudicate these claims, obviously with Michael Jackson dead, uh, there is no such thing as defamation against a dead person. What is your evaluation of what the options are and how the estate is proceeding legally to try to clear Michael Jackson's name here? Well, I'm not involved in any of the civil suits by Mr. Robson or Mr. Safechuck. I have not participated in any of the court hearings. I've not reviewed any of the documents. I, w I wasn't present for any depositions. I don't know what people have said or not said in the course of the lawsuit, so I can't really speak directly on that issue. Uh, my perception at a distance is that the estate is being very, very aggressive and very effective in trying to protect the name and the likeness and the image and the reputation of Michael Jackson. I'm actually very impressed with the aggressive approach they've taken, and I hope they continue it, because these accusations are scurrilous. I've not seen the, uh, the film, Leaving Neverland. My understanding is they don't ever talk to anyone on the other side. They basically take accept Mr. Robson and Mr. Savechuck's accusations. And remember, we're talking years after accusations like this were made. We're talking about people who would have had plenty of time to look at the details very closely of what accusations other people have made. And if you're going to either intentionally or unintentionally pattern yourself after prior allegations, there would be plenty of time and plenty of information available for one to study, if that's what you're doing. I don't know whether these people really believe what they're saying or not. I mean, the longer I 
walk through life, the more I realize human beings have a way of convincing themselves that what they're saying is true, even if it looks ridiculous. So they may actually believe what they're saying is true. I don't know, but I certainly don't. You mentioned that Leaving Neverland doesn't give any of the other side, which is 100% accurate. The most glaring witness in this whole thing that they omit totally from even being mentioned is Brandy Jackson, the niece of Michael Jackson, who dated Wade Robson for eight years, including two years during which Wade now claims he was abused by Michael Jackson. Brandy is sure that Wade is not telling the truth, and she knew him exceedingly well. If in a prosecution case, uh, a Wade Robson had testified without ever mentioning Brandy Jackson, and you as a defense attorney was able to tell, show the jury, hey, you never got told about a Brandy Jackson. Here she is, and here's her story. How do you think that would impact a, a jury's view of a story like this? Well, I don't know what he allegedly told uh, Mrs. Jackson. Uh, I'm really not knowledgeable about that relationship. Um, I've, I believe what she's saying. I, I believe he never raised the issue because it never happened. But I'm not a witness to any of this. Uh, I just know I looked this person in the eye and I chatted with him extensively and his mother and sister were sitting right there too. And I believe he told the truth in the trial. I believe he told the truth to me. And the new stories, the new versions make no sense to me whatsoever. Talk to me about the media. Uh, I know that uh, you have been very critical of the way the media has treated Michael Jackson in general and specifically how they re how they responded to the 2005 verdict, which they clearly did not like. I was part of that media that was, as a talk show host in Los Angeles, I was surprised by the verdict, but, but I thought it was legally correct because I did not believe that the prosecution had proven their case. At that point, I was still naive about the facts of all of this, and I thought, well, there must be something there for them to go this far. Now... I've totally changed my mind after getting to know you and researching this after leaving Neverland. But what is your evaluation of of the media just deciding to you know, to blindly accept ridiculous allegations that are contradicted by voluminous evidence simply because it fits a narrative that they like? Well, the media is a business. They they're in the business of generating revenue and getting ratings, and that's their number one priority. Their number one priority is not justice or fairness. It's shock value, it's controversy, it's colorful uh, experience. The media wants what business requires, and you can't keep that out of your mind because if you think they're out for fairness or justice, you're just, you're, you're naive. I remember after the Jackson acquittals, I had lunch with Barry Gordy, the founder of Motown, and his family, and he said to me, do you realize you cost the worldwide media billions of dollars when you acquitted them? Because he said the final chapter had to be a conviction, where they hauled him off to jail, where they brought him back for hearings, dressed in an orange jump shoot and chains, without makeup, without his normal apparel, leading up to perhaps one of the biggest sentencings in American history. This is what the media wanted, and they were denied that when the jury said not guilty 14 times. So uh, I will forever be scarred by that experience. I remember. You know, when we walked into the courtroom, sat at council table, uh, I looked around and I saw all these reporters with big smiles on their faces and a big gleam in their eye. They were so excited by what was going to happen that day. And after the last not guilty, I hugged Michael Jackson and looked and I could see the, the disappointment in their faces. The story was over. The final chapter could not be written the way they wanted it to be and, and business had suffered because of that. They had to abandon Santa Maria. They had to work, walk on to some other subject, and it was very disappointing to them. Justice is not their goal. Re ratings and revenue are what they want. Uh, amen to that. Uh, okay, so one more big picture question here. That happened in 2005. We're now in 2019. <clears throat> in between, the cultural rules, largely because of the news media, have dramatically shifted mostly because of this the so-called Me Too movement. I'm curious, in general and then also in specific with regard to Michael Jackson's case, how impactful have has the rules being changed because of Me Too been 
on how these kinds of cases are evaluated in general? And specifically, do you think you could have gotten an acquittal in 2019 under the same circumstances with Michael Jackson today that you did in 2005? Well, if you're talking about Michael Jackson, you have to remember how vicious the media was in mm -hmm. 2005. I mean, the media worldwide were, were at best mocking Michael Jackson, at worst calling him one of the world's greatest villains. And the media had already convicted him. The media had already tried him and found him guilty. And the media onslaught to see him go to prison was so, so effort. I mean, it, it was, I don't have to explain it. It never ended. It was 24 hour cycle. Um, do I think it would have been harder to acquit him now? I actually don't because the media pressure then was so bad. I don't think it could have been worse. Mm -hmm. During the week of jury deliberations, major networks were showing the jail cell he was going to go to. They were talking about what food he would eat, what schedule he would keep, whether he would be on suicide watch. All of it was designed to influence the jury to get a conviction. So in, in Michael Jackson's case, I don't think it could have been worse. But in terms of other people accused, it's, it's a very, very troubling environment because Me Too has a lot of good elements to it. I think to flesh out sexual harassment or worse, sexual assault, the way it's being done, to some extent is very appropriate. The problem is that emotion is now substituting for due process. And if you're accused before you have the ability to even speak up on your behalf and before the rules even kick in to give you a fair hearing, you are condemned, you are fired, you are vilified. There's something wrong with that. We've had other movements in American history where emotion and passion replaced due process, replaced fairness. And I'm talking about the Salem witch trials. I'm talking about the anti-communist movement. I'm talking about rounding up Japanese on the eve of World War II. America in its history has had phases where passionate movements take off and due process, fundamental fairness, the Constitution takes second fiddle. And we have to be very careful right now because some of that's going on. A couple more questions about uh, leaving Neverland that we didn't get to in, in the first section of, of our interview, Tom. Um, you mentioned how horrific the charges were against Michael Jackson in 2005 and, and that the, the primary accuser there was a, a cancer survivor who, if we're to believe the accusers in Leaving Neverland, they prevented from getting a fair trial because they, one, either perjured themselves, in the case of Wade Robson, that's what he's saying now, or in the case of James Safechuck, he purposely refused to testify by uh, denying Michael Jackson's pleas for him to testify. Yet there's no outrage anywhere in the movie or even in the media reaction to the movie uh, about that. And to me, this is a tell. This is a tell that no one really believes their story. Because if they really believe their story, they would be tipped off at them for having denied the 2005 trial to be fair. Do you see where I'm going with that? I do, but here's, here's one of the current problems with the world we live in. Uh, in this particular time and place, when sexual assault cases go to trial, prosecutors are now bringing in so-called experts to justify anything uh, an alleged victim does. If the alleged victim reports it quickly, they say that's consistent with abuse. If the alleged victim delays for years reporting it, they say that's consistent with abuse. If the alleged victim is very consistent in their descriptions of what they say happened, the experts say that's consistent with being abused. If the alleged victim is wildly inconsistent with descriptions of what happened, they say that's consistent with abuse. So virtually in this day and age, there are experts who will say whatever the so-called victim says or did is consistent with abuse. And it's very troubling for defense lawyers because you know, generally people assume that if you are assaulted, you should come forward quickly. You should talk consistently about what you claim happened. You shouldn't get, you know, your dates wrong and, and your descriptions about the fundamental claim wrong. Um, but nowadays, whatever you do or say and when you say it and how you do it and when you present it, uh, it's all being described as consistent with a survivor of abuse, and something's wrong with that. 
that to me is the essence of why I think leaving Neverland is so dangerous because I think it's almost a test case for if we believe this, we'll believe anything. There's literally no way to discredit an, an allegation, no matter how old it is, no, how, no matter how uncorroborated it is, no matter how much it's contradicted by their own testimony. And, and that to me is, is really dangerous. And I, you, you just listed all the things that are not uh, uh, consistent with someone not telling the truth. In other words, virtually everything is consistent with being abused. I'm curious, have you found anything at all that the current rules would allow for as proof that someone is not telling the truth when they make a claim of abuse? Well, that's typically up to the jury. If it's a jury trial, which most of these trials are, the jury has to decide who's credible and who's not. And when they're subjected to continual testimony that says whatever you say and when you say it and how you say it is consistent with abuse, that causes problems for the defense because we're supposed to be innocent till proven guilty beyond any reasonable doubt. And right now, given the emotions and passions of the environment we live in in America, I think that fairness and due process, uh, I think our burden of proof, the prosecutors are, are supposed to, to meet, uh, are being thrown out the window and is something wrong with that. Well, if you find a loophole in the rules that where, where you're still able to prove that someone's not telling the truth, please let me know because I haven't found it. I, I've been looking for it for several years, and there's nothing that the the pro, uh, you know, they claim to be pro-sex abuse survivor group, uh, there's nothing that they will accept as legitimate evidence that an allegation is false. And that's just absurd because we know that people sometimes don't tell the truth uh, for whatever reason. And in this case, there's lots of money to provide a motivation for that. And how much do you think money is a motivator in a case like this with specifically the stories in, in Leaving Neverland? Well, money can be a great motivator. I mean, my understanding is that Mr. Robson wanted to be the choreographer for the Michael Jackson show in Las Vegas. Now, if he had been subjected to the horrific abuse that he's claiming, would he have wanted to be the choreographer of a show that praises Michael Jackson and his life and his music and his, his choreography and all the things that made him famous and successful? I doubt it. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, is money a motivator? Is fame a motivator? Of course. Money and fame will always motivate people in many different ways, and we have to be very careful about that. Of course to what we're talking about with these changing rules, now the other side would say, well, even though Michael Jackson was dead for many years when that, uh, that choreographer job uh, went south, he was still under Michael's thumb, he was still uh, suffering from the trauma, he, he was still, uh, somehow, this was still the grooming effects. I mean, there's literally, literally nothing that they can't rationalize. Well, my understanding is that Mr. Robson, among many other things, is claiming that he was anally penetrated by Michael Jackson and that uh, his underwear were bleeding, were bloody. Mm -hmm. Right. Did he forget that when he spoke to me? That's had unlikely. He, had he blanked it out? Had he just denied that it happened? It doesn't make sense to me at all because he was so adamant that Michael had not ever improperly touched him. A large part of the reason why uh, people uh, that have accepted leaving Never Neverland as true have done so is because they already presume that Michael Jackson is, if not guilty, at least shows signs of being a pedophile in their minds, in their perception. And I have to admit that I was one of those people who, who many, many years ago bought in that there has to be something there. And, and the main reasons for that were what I have found to be largely mythical uh, circumstances surrounding the initial allegations. I'm a big believer you always have to go back to the first allegation. The first allegation tells you everything in a case like this. Because if it's not very strong, then there, that, mean, that leaves room for the subsequent allegations to, to be even weaker. And a couple of the myths I want to talk to you about and get your take on them and whether or not you believe they're mythical is, first of all, the, the, the settlement that was reached in the Jordy Chandler case. And it would, for huge amounts of money, it's been reported to be in a $20 million range. And for a lot of people, including myself, that's hard to wrap your brain around as to how that's not a guilty plea. Now, interestingly, as we speak, your most recent high-profile client, Bill Cosby, has been very upset that his insurance company has settled some claims that he, he does not believe are true, the facts don't seem to indicate are true, and that they've done this against his own wishes. There are those who have claimed that something similar happened with Michael Jackson in that settlement. Can you 
shed any light on that for us? Well, I talked to Michael extensively about the settlement in the early 90s. It was one of his biggest regrets. He said he never should have settled it. He was advised by lawyers and business advisors to settle it, that it was damaging his reputation, that the money was a drop in the bucket with the billions he could make with all of his talent and all of his fans around the world. And they said, just stop the bad press, end the case right now, write a check and move on with your career. You'll be over this very quickly. And what he discovered was it opened Pandora's box. It resulted in more lawsuits. You know, I, I, I used to say the feeling in Neverland was, you know, why work if you can sue Michael Jackson? I mean, he didn't like litigation. He didn't like going to court. He didn't like swimming around lawyers all the time. And he looked very vulnerable and very wealthy. So all of a sudden, he settled this case. Lawsuits started flying left and right. He said it was his biggest regret. And I think it was bad advice for him. He should have fought it and he should have beat it. But technically, it sounds what you're saying is that while he didn't agree with it and it was over his objections, that it wasn't technically just the insurance company that did that. Can you Is that accurate or not? Uh, the insurance company, to my knowledge, did not engineer that settlement at all. It was business advisors and lawyers who were around Michael Jackson and said, write a check, get rid of this darn thing. It was not done by the insurance companies against his will. He was advised, this is what you have to do. You've got bigger fish to fry. You are the best known person in the world. You can make this money back in a heartbeat. So get rid of this. The publicity is really hurting your business opportunities. Okay, so that's good. That's, that's good information to have. I think it tells basically the same story, but in a, in a, in a different way, that, that Michael Jackson was not, in his own mind, admitting guilt there. And, but for well, the average, uh, remember, the settlement agreement specifically said he doesn't admit guilt. He doesn't right. admit any wrongdoing. But people, people in the average world will look at whatever it was, $20 million in that range, and they go, well, my gosh, how could that not be admitting guilt? You have to put yourself in Michael Jackson's shoes. It was really a drop in the bucket by comparison with what he was worth and what he could earn. And he was advised repeatedly, write the check, end it now. Now, of course, Jordy Chandler didn't come into the 2005 trial. Uh, that's always been a matter of, uh, of uh, great interest, especially among Michael Jackson fans who say, well, wait a minute, why would you not be part of that trial? And there's always been a, a presumption that, that you had a lot of evidence ready to go to discredit him if, if that happened. Can you, can you tell us more about that? Well, witnesses contacted the defense claiming that Mr. Jordan had told them that it didn't happen. And Jordy Chandler, excuse me, Mr. Jordy Chandler had told them it didn't happen and that he would never forgive his parents for making him admit that. Now, we don't, I don't know if that was true or not, but witnesses came forward to say that. We tried to contact him and were not successful. Our understanding was that he fled overseas and didn't want the prosecution trying to force him into the courtroom. Um, so I've never spoken to him. Uh, the investigators on the defense side didn't speak to him. There is an FBI file where it appears that some agents may speak to him because the FBI was working with the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department uh, in putting together a prosecution of Michael Jackson. There was a document that was redacted that appeared to suggest that they tried to ask him to testify and he had no interest in doing that. Uh, but we had witnesses who were ready to impeach him if he did get on the stand and say Michael Jackson had molested him. And from a factual standpoint, one of the things that's out there that even I bought into for, for a while until I learned more, uh, and, and this deals with a, a guy who's a mutual nemesis of ours, Jim Clemente, who I know neither of us have a lot of respect for, but Jim claims to have been in the room when, when Michael Jackson uh, infamously was forced to expose his genitalia uh, for inspection, and that supposedly uh, his genitalia had matched the description given by Jordy Chandler. Uh, I, um, I no longer trust anything Jim says, getting to know him exceedingly well, but I was rather startled when I finally saw the handwritten notes that were related to that inspection. And they're frankly laughable, the idea that Chandler accurately described Michael Jackson's genitalia. First of all, he didn't even get it correct whether or not he was circumcised. And the, the description is incredibly generic. It's almost cartoon-like. How would you describe the, the myth with regard to that issue in comparison to the reality? Well, it was always my understanding that the description was, was inaccurate when it came to whether he was circumcised or not. Uh, I know that both sides have basically 
spun their idea that, that the, the prosecution always said it was accurate, the defense always said it was inaccurate. But if you make a mistake on whether someone's circumcised or not, that's, that's a pretty big mistake. And it was always my understanding that that was, you know, it was a very inaccurate description for that reason. Um, but it wasn't just that. It's it's not even very specific. I mean, it's I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a drawing of a of a penis that that looks just like a you know a, a cartoon mushroom. I it, mean, it, it, it was, in my opinion, and I looked at the evidence. It was not an accurate description at all. But remember, um, he wouldn't cooperate with the prosecutors. He wouldn't cooperate with the defense. Uh, I certainly never met the man. Um, and the prosecution's take was that if the defense has witnesses who will say he told them it didn't happen, their take is that that was typical of a victim of abuse. They always want to deny that it happened, particularly men or boys talking to their peers. So they were prepared to say that, you know, Mr. Chandler's denials, if the witnesses claim there were denials, were very consistent with someone who's running away from their abuse, who wants to hide their abuse, or who's embarrassed by their abuse. As I say, one of the problems we have today is that whatever a so-called victim says or does is now portrayed as consistent with abuse. Which is, is incredibly uh, troubling. Um, I guess in the big picture, I, I always like to look at, at things, okay, if this was true, what would naturally happen? And if Michael Jackson really was a serial child molester and obviously had access to every boy he could possibly imagine, uh, to me, everything about this situation would be different. First of all, he would not uh, have been molesting the boys that he was most publicly connected to. Because the number one thing that's a problem, if you're making an allegation against Michael Jackson, is you have to prove contact because he's Michael Jackson. Well, let me, let me tell you something about this that, as always, weighed on me. In the Chandler situation, the father, as I understand it, and I wasn't involved in this investigation mm -hmm. or case, wanted to do some entertainment-related projects with Michael Jackson. And my understanding is that when they were trying to resolve this matter, the matter being the accusation that Michael had molested Jordy Chandler, that the father was, was negotiating with Michael to try and do some entertainment projects with Michael, which ultimately didn't happen. I knew someone who was at one of these negotiating sessions and told me that the father had actually hugged Michael Jackson when they started the negotiation. Now, if your son had been horribly and criminally molested, like they were claiming, are you going to hug the molester? Are you going to want to do entertainment projects with the molester? And again, then we switch to the Wade Robson situation. If he had been horribly abused the way he has described, would he want to be the, the choreographer right. for the Michael Jackson show, a show which praises Michael Jackson in so many different ways? These things make no sense to me. Right. Um, if, I, if, if, if I had a son and the son I thought was molested by someone, I'd want them in prison. I wouldn't be talking about doing an entertainment project with them. Right, and, and I get all that, but I'm now looking at it from the standpoint of the alleged abuser. The alleged abuser, if he was a criminal mastermind, would not be abusing those that there's already footage of him worldwide, like in a commercial with James Safechuck being connected to. You, you, you could easily do this in a way where you were abusing boys who were not uh, publicly connected to you. That's number one. But then going from that, if Michael Jackson was really doing that, there would be more than four, you know, people argue with the number, but I think it's four. There would be more than four allegations at this point. He's been dead for 10 years. He, he, is, he is worth ridiculous amounts of money. People have already settled with him, so the blood was in the water. Shouldn't there be dozens and dozens of accusers that are credible if he was really a serial child, child molester? I agree with you. It makes no sense. Uh, and it makes no sense this many years later to come out uh, out of nowhere and suddenly switch your story and switch your facts and switch your memory of what happened. It, it doesn't make sense to me. So finally, uh, Tom, I, I, I'm curious, if you, if you had a chance to, to, to talk to uh, James Safechuck and, and, and Wade Robson, especially Wade Robson now, since you, you uh, questioned him under oath in 2005, what, what would you say to them man to man? Well, I don't particularly want to meet these individuals, and I don't want to see the uh, the movie Leaving Neverland. I, I don't believe the accusations. I think they're very self-serving. Uh, I don't know who or what has influenced their mm -hmm. change in, in testimony and description. I don't trust it, um, and I'll leave it at that. 
I hope this isn't an unfair question to ask. Uh, I'm sure you'll tell me if it is, but do you have a sense of how, if Michael was still alive today, how he might react to the situation? Oh, I think he would be very upset, but I also don't think he would be surprised because so many false accusations were leveled at him throughout his lifetime. He was repeatedly sued. I mean, these rumors used to sp spread like wildfire that he'd done all sorts of things he hadn't done. So I don't think, remember, he was the most famous person in the world uh, when I knew him. And as the most famous person in the world, perceived as immensely talented, immensely wealthy, and immensely vulnerable, he was constantly being subjected to false allegations. So do I think it would surprise him that somebody turned on him? No, I don't. I think Michael Jackson was someone who had trouble trusting people because so many had turned on him, so many had tried to use him. It was, it's one of the sad realities of fame that you have something that everyone else wants, but once you, once you get it, there were so many pitfalls and so many problems associated with it, including figuring out who your friends really are. And Michael had a great difficulty trusting anybody. Tom Ezro, thanks so much for your great insight on this case. We really appreciate your time and your fight for the truth. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So thanks again to Tom Ezro for his time. Hope you've enjoyed that. Again, you can watch the first half hour of that on YouTube via video if you so choose. And I do hope that you'll share the interview because it definitely needs to be heard. Now, as far as the larger picture of whether or not this battle is is doomed to failure, which, by the way, I've always presumed that it would be. I told Taj Jackson when he was <clears throat> uh, in uh, the, the very studio where, the, where we're doing this podcast at the very beginning of this controversy that I did not have great optimism for how this would all turn out. There were a couple of developments that uh, are not positive for the long term with regard to whether or not leaving Neverland will be discredited completely and where Michael Jackson's legacy will be cleaned of, of this uh, unfair disparagement. Number one is that this week it was reported by the LA Times that there's a local high school where apparently Michael Jackson attended very briefly I think it's a high school. Maybe it's a middle school. No, you know what? I think it's a middle school. Michael Jackson briefly attended a middle school where they named the auditorium after him, the Michael Jackson Auditorium. And the school where Jackson actually visited when they uh, named the auditorium for him is doing something very odd. They're holding a vote I, among the staff. I think it's among the staff. I don't know whether or not the, the parents are having any say in this, but I think it's just the staff of the school are voting whether or not to remove the name of the auditorium. And uh, the vote was apparently still ongoing. And I have not heard any any report on the results. The results might not all be in yet. Maybe it hasn't been reported. Uh, but this is, uh, unfortunately, a very, very significant event. And uh, I have no idea how that vote's going to go, but I'm, I'm not optimistic because people don't have the facts. And let's face it, liberal academics are going to immediately say, oh, sex abuse. Yeah. Now, I'm assuming it's a, it's a private ballot, in which case you might at least have a chance because people might go, well, wait a minute, this is silly. Uh, you know, why, why are we going to cut our nose off we got this great uh, thing this michael jackson auditorium it gives us notoriety there's some cost involved in removing the name why why do this i think there's a chance that that might carry the day now i immediately when i saw the story i texted it to taj jackson who's kind of been the the spokesperson for the the uh, jackson family and I said, Taj, you guys have got to immediately contact this school and offer to go down there, since you live right here, to answer any questions that the staff has about this bogus movie. Because this is the kind of thing that could be, in theory, a great victory for you. If you win the vote, that might stem the tide. However, on, and conversely, if you lose the vote and they take down Michael Jackson's name off the auditorium, now it's like a contagion. Now, now it spreads everywhere because even in Los Angeles, they're taking down Michael Jackson's name from an auditorium of a school where he attended. Taj weirdly didn't even respond to the text. Now, I'm not, I don't want to rip Taj, but I, I have had this happen so many times to me in, in situations like this where I, I make suggestions based upon the idea that people need to understand the importance and the urgency of this. It sounds inconsequential. It sounds like it's not that big of a deal, but it's actually huge. 
in the in the realm of public perception. And you know, to me, if you if Taj and some other members of the Jackson family had gone down there, that might have a really a significant impact, but I have no indication that, that happened, and so I'm not particularly optimistic as to how that's all going to go down. There was another story involving Corey Feldman. Corey Feldman is uh, a guy who has been very supportive of Michael Jackson. You know, he's the, the child actor who has been on a crusade to expose Hollywood sex abusers, and he himself has been a sex abused uh, victim. And he has always said that Michael Jackson did not abuse him. And when Leaving Neverland came out, he supported Michael Jackson, but then he got torched on social media. And so, and I happen to know, because I've seen the text from Corey Feldman, that Corey Feldman changed his tune because he felt coerced, he felt pressured, he felt like he was going to be deplatformed from this cause of child sex abuse victims if he did not at least allow for the idea that the Leaving Neverland guys are telling the truth. So you're not allowed to say that a sex abuse accuser is is lying. You're just not allowed to do that unless you want to be excommunicated from from the whole cause, which of course is is troubling right off the bat i mean basically uh, Corey feldman got called Bless i mean that's you're not allowed to do that you're not allowed to do that and even when you have intimate well not intimate but you have obviously direct contact and knowledge of that person and here you were in a situation where if he was an abuser you would have been abused right nope sorry you're not allowed because that goes against the narrative that we prefer so he, he basically backed off his support for Jackson, and now he's gone even one step further, which is just really dumb, and it's pathetic that the media immediately jumps all over this. Corey Feldman's now saying that it's possible that maybe he was groomed by Michael Jackson, even though he was not actually abused. Now, let's do the logic on this. Let's do the math on this. So what you're saying, then, is that the proof that Michael Jackson might be a sex abuse uh, uh, pedophile, or that he might have committed sex abuse against children. That The proof of this is he did not abuse you. Now, this is the bizarre world we're living in, where you're not abused, even though you were in a position to be abused, you fit the profile of someone who would be abused, but you're saying for sure you were not abused, no sign of abuse, but that's now evidence that you think he might have been an abuser. Folks, it doesn't get more insane than that. It's just flat out ridiculous. I mean, think about that. You're now setting up the rules to where if you are someone who spends time with children at all, and you love children, and you know, obviously Michael Jackson did for better or for worse, you're setting up the rule now that everything is grooming without ever actually having evidence of any sex abuse. Now, I saw the same thing happen with Jerry Sandusky. This is the same movie. It's just a rerun. But it's incredibly dangerous. It's not fair. And, of course, the media, they take what Corey Feldman says because it fits their narrative as gospel now, even though it's incredibly important to keep pointing out he was not abused. So when someone who says, I was not abused, even though I was in a position to be abused, is used as evidence of abuse, you cannot win. The, the, the deck is stacked against you. We're, we're, we're not playing a fair game here. And that's largely what this is. It's a game. And it's not right. It's not fair. And again, as a pessimist, I'm not optimistic about how it's all going to turn out here, or at least not optimistic about the the efforts to try to turn this around. Because once that's out there, it's almost impossible. The rules have now been set up. And I talked about that with Tom Mesro, and he was uh, very eloquent in talking about how Me Too has totally changed the rules in a dangerous direction. Once this is out there the rules make it almost impossible to combat so it might be too late Uh, i don't want to uh you know depress anybody but uh the reality is i doubt we're going to win this thing but i'm all about the truth i've done the best i can to put the truth out there i think we've done an excellent job of that and i hope you appreciate that and hope you uh do share it with others who might also care about the truth 
I do feel uh, compelled to at least mention one other quick thing before this hour of the World According to Zig podcast is up. It also goes to what a strange life I live. <laughs> and for those who are not familiar with the podcast, you're going to be like, what? But I feel like I need to mention uh, how weird it is that the NFL draft just finished and that for the second straight year, one of the most talked about guys was Josh Rosen. Uh, Josh Rosen, who uh, people who have followed my career uh, very, very closely might know, uh, has a connection to John Ziegler. Now, for, first of all, let's tell you who Josh Rosen is. Josh Rosen was the uh, quarterback for UCLA a couple years ago who last year was drafted number 10 by the Arizona Cardinals. And at the time, that was a really big deal in, in my life because when Josh Rosen played eighth grade football at Chadwick Academy in Palos Verdes, California, his head football coach and his offensive coordinator was John Ziegler. <laughs> as bizarre as that is, it's a true story. It, what's even more bizarre about that is I've never played a down of organized football in my entire life. And here, here I am. Now, granted, it was eighth grade, but I was his head coach and offensive coordinator. Uh, I have uh, I have now uh, laid claim to a first round NFL draft pick of a quarterback, not just a, a quarter, any quarterback, but one of the most talked about quarterbacks in the NFL draft and a potential franchise quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals. And that was just very strange. Uh, and I was someone who did not believe that that Josh should have been one of the top picks in the draft. Uh, I knew he was a spectacular athlete, but I did not like his attitude. Uh, he did not listen to our, no, no, granted he might have had good reason not to listen to me, but he, <laughs> he did not listen. It was, a, it was almost an upset when he called the plays exactly as I had instructed him to. He didn't even show up for our last game of the season, which we ended up winning without him, which was maybe the greatest accomplishment of my, my very short, uh, co- uh, not college, but my, my short, uh, football coaching career. Um, so I didn't have a hugely positive view of Josh Rosen. Athletically great, although I didn't think he was a first-round NFL quarterback great, but he was certainly great. I was not surprised he played well at UCLA. But I would not have advised anyone to take him that high in the draft. Uh, but no one asked me. <laughs> and the Cardinals picked him 10th. Well, this year the Cardinals did something that's basically unprecedented in the history of the NFL draft. They traded away their previous year number one draft pick quarterback for a, a basically a sandwich and a Coke uh, after having, you know, and the weirdest part is it's not like, you know, he, he didn't play uh, and he just sat on the bench because they figured out he's not very good. He played a lot last year. He won three games for a crappy team. His statistics weren't great, but his offensive line was terrible. He actually beat Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay uh, on a bad weather day, which really shocked me because, you know, Josh is a Southern California kid who's never seen rain probably in any game he's ever played in his life. Uh, so, uh, you know, it wasn't like it was a total disaster. But the Cardinals decided to, to uh, draft the Heisman Trophy winner, who I'm not even sure is going to be an NFL star because his style of play is not conducive to the NFL. But they decided to pick him number one, which, of course, meant that Josh Rosen was now expendable. They traded him to the Miami Dolphins for basically nothing. Uh, and I always thought that Arizona was one of the best places that could uh, pick Josh, because Josh needs to go to someplace where it's not a huge media market. I mean, like the the New York Giants, it would have been a disaster if Josh Rosen went to the New York Giants because because the New York media would eat Josh Rosen alive, at least the Josh Rosen I knew. And eighth grade is young, but he was post-puberty. He's pretty much the same guy uh, as he is today. Uh, physically, he's not. But, you know, th- there's a lot of the same guy that's, that, that was there. This was in 2010. It wasn't that long ago. It was, you know, less than uh, nine years ago. So, um, so he couldn't go to New York. Uh, I don't even think L.A. would. L.A. would have been slightly different because it's not that intense here, and he has the UCLA background. So he could have played at one of the UCLA, the two Los Angeles schools, schools, Los Angeles teams. Um, but uh, that didn't happen because they've got quarterbacks. Uh, but Miami will be okay. Miami's a big media market. It, it's not quite as intense as New York is or Chicago. It's also good weather. Uh, it's not a dome, effectively, like Arizona is. But uh, I found it interesting that uh, Arizona did to Josh 
uh, what they did. I'm still, I actually am rooting for Josh. I, I want to see him do well, but I'm not at all surprised that this has not gone according to plan. And uh, all they needed to do was ask me, but no one ever did. <laughs> so, so it's somewhat of a nuanced position on this. I'm rooting for Josh. I think he'll do okay in Miami. I do not believe he'll ever be a superstar, uh, not just because of his attitude, but because I don't think he's quite as good as a lot of the uh, scouts thought that he was. Uh, but we'll see. So I had to mention that since it's definitely pr- part of the world according to Zig, the very strange world that is my life. As is always the case, I ask only two things of you. Number one, please make sure you share this podcast via social media, Twitter, Facebook, word of mouth, what have you. And number two, do yourself a favor. If you're one of those people who sleeps and when you sleep, you use sheets, please pay attention to this important message. My name is John Ziegler. Our website is freespeechbroadcasting.com. Coffee? Oh, thanks. How did you sleep? Ugh, like a baby. I don't want to get out of bed. Ever. 